Hey, this is Kenyon Drake. You're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. All right. That wasn't so bad. No, I'd say you're back. I'd say you're back at it. Thursday, April 2nd, Andy, Mike, and Jason, excited to be with you. Once again, very exciting episode. Our early top 10 running back ranking show. Excited to get into it. Some news. We've got a pants check once again. Jason. Oh. Jason, uh, mm. pants on, off. What do we got? Uh, today I am wearing both pants and underpants. I am oh, really? grown up. I had to leave the house, ran down to the studio. Uh, we've gotten a lot of grief uh, lately, Andy, you and I. Mike has this cool, you know, like, oh, look at his cool man cave setup studio. He's got guitars. He's, He's got, got a keyboard. So- He's got a Big old amplifiers in Andy the background. I, yeah, we committed to um, trying to make ours look like his. And so we yep. went out, picked up some stuff, did our best job of mm-hmm. being cool. Like Mike, I think we I think we did it. I, I think our backgrounds look excellent. Maybe even better than Mike's now. Yeah, I would love to get Mike's take because he's the resident cool cat, you know, of the group. But I did we I do all right? Say, look, I'm pretty impressed. I am I'm impressed you all those things you talked about that I have that are cool you have all of them now <laughs> I know it's it's pretty oh, awesome Oh thank uh, you man that means a lot you can check should, them out youtubecom yes. slash the fantasy footballers subscribe click the bell check out how Jason and I have outfitted ourselves at home <laughs> This is so stupid <laughs> <laughs> Um here's a quick question for you guys it's from Twitter. What's the best landing spot for a rookie wide receiver in this year's draft? Mm. And um, I know when I dove into this a little bit, it took me a while when looking at the draft board to really find a destination that I loved. Arizona's kind of been removed. That would have yeah. been the one that I, I, I kind of honed in on before the Hopkins trade. Uh, but it took me a while. So where did you end up for a best destination? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I have. Uh, I wanted to find you. Know, where's a spot that has a younger quarterback who is? He's a franchise quarterback. It's not just even. We think he is. He's the franchise quarterback. He's excellent. He's had monster fantasy production. This quarterback before he has. He has uh, had enough production to have his wide receiver be a top five wide receiver, and that is Deshaun Watson. <laughs> And the Houston Texans, who need a freaking wide receiver now. And look, they're in a really good spot to get a number one. Where Will Fuller is, I think Will Fuller is actually an excellent wide receiver. I don't think that he is a number one type of guy. They or need a number of one. playing 16 games. Sure, that's it's really hard to imagine that the way that his career has gone. But Houston needs a number one wide receiver. To go along with Stills and with Kenny Bills and, and Will Fuller. So the Houston Texans are my pick. My <laughs> yes. 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 I oh. hope we hear that drop a lot this year. The, we oh, we if, might. I mean if Kenny Stills like finally becomes something, Jason and I oh. will the we pants will, check will need to happen for the rest the, of the, the season. Odds, <laughs> the odds are not in your favor. They are a team right now with a number of twos and threes. So it is a it's an interesting, uh, you know, the Hopkins <laughs> trade stole the headlines. Cobb, but but he's there. That's what I mean. That's why I said twos and threes. Right. Okay. You see what I said? Yeah. Uh, for me, it was the Eagles at 21 because it follows some of the logic that you just brought up about Watson. You have a, a team that was ninth in the NFL in pass attempts last year. Uh, nobody is under the illusion that Alshon Jeffrey or Deshaun Jackson are the future at the wide receiver position for Philadelphia. So Eagles at 21, some of these other teams uh, possibly passing on some of the top tier rookie wide receivers. They can build around a new number one in Philadelphia. So that's, that's where I went. You know, I would have gone Philadelphia as well. You say, you, you know, it was a hard question for you. For me, it was 
pretty easy, but I ended up where you are, which is the Eagles. But because you already had them down, I'd throw a third team out there, which is the Colts. Um, the Colts, I, I, you know, I don't believe they have a, a good enough number two. Now, some people really believe in Paris Campbell. He's the truth. I didn't really love him last year coming in. He wasn't one of my favorite prospects. And then you had mostly a, a missed season due to injury. And teams don't always wait around, even if they spent capital. I mean, we've seen this in the past, uh, first, second round wide receivers that get injured or lose their first year, and, and they don't always, uh, you know, pan out. And so I think that getting a Phillip Rivers in there at quarterback, they could use a, a better number two. Not, you know, I, I wouldn't ever expect someone to come in and be the number one there. Um, and I, I do, despite the Philip Rivers signing, think that the Colts have a good general manager, which matters to me as far as like longevity and future and what they're going to do to replace him later. So if I'm picking spots for wide receivers I like, I wouldn't mind them going to Indianapolis. Did you guys see the news about Frank Reich and the due diligence he had done on Tom Brady watching the film I, from the past no, two years? So it, it should tell people something when – very trusted offensive minds, Frank Reich, Bruce Arians, are fighting over Tom Brady. I think it, it did for mm. me. Frank Reich, they were going to make a really strong pitch. He talked about the fact that Brady's lost nothing um, in the film work that he looked at over the last couple of years. It was interesting to me. Obviously, they ended up with Phillip Rivers, but uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what Rivers can do under Frank Reich, and they could definitely use a couple more weapons. A reminder, we've got a giveaway, footclangiveaway.com, a signed Keenan Allen jersey. I want to thank everybody genuinely over at jointhefoot.com, everybody that's been yeah. supporting supporting the show, especially at times like this uh, when we are in – we're kind of living day to day, are we not? I mean, it's <laughs> – No, days don't exist anymore, Hour man. to hour? I there don't is, know. There is morning and nighttime. That's all, that's all I know about. So many people out there adjusting their routines, their lives, their livelihoods – so many people uh, suddenly uh, stay at home uh, teachers <laughs> and um, yeah I, you know we we certainly appreciate everybody that is and has and, and has begun supporting us at jointhefoot.com and this show is coming out on a Thursday we do an extra episode every Thursday for the Foot Clan only mailbag questions from the Foot Clan well and so the Foot Clan also heard this show on Wednesday that's true that's true they got a little early yeah we'll sneak so they peek. got their thank you a little early that's, that's right. right. And uh, you can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. Let's get into some news. News and notes from around the league. All right, the NFL. This was big news. They've officially expanded the postseason to 14 teams. What took them so long? <laughs> for the 2020-2021 season. So not this year. But. Every conference will now have a third wild card game, or I'm sorry, yes, a, a third wild card. That is, that's this year. Yeah, that's this year, the 2020 oh. 2021 season. There is a you meet. forgot what year it was. I don't blame you. I I definitely <laughs> honed in on the 2021 <laughs> part. No, okay. that is that is this year. It, what's what's funny is the way it was brought up was the NFL has this option that they can expand the postseason, add two games in wild card weekend, but they're gonna have to take some time to figure it out, and you're like. The NFL can add two games to the playoffs. You think they aren't going to figure that out in about five hours? That's so much extra money for them. I, I mean, know, it, before the I don't CBA like was, it, by the you, way. What? Oh, come on. Boo. Boo. This system was perfect. It was People so good already. He will no, scream does, at his TV as he watches extra play. No, okay. Football. Let, me, let, me, let me give you the caveat here. I like it from a more football standpoint. Like I do all more football things. I don't like it from the reality standpoint that, look, if you have a bye, which will now only be one team, it per is conference. going to be a, what did you say, Jason? Per, per conference. conference. Yeah. Each, each Certainly, team. yes. I understand. It's not just I'm one just saying, the entire NFL. You said one NFL. team. Yeah, so yes, you know. One team per conference instead of two. It is a massive advantage to have that number one spot. That's all I'm saying. That team has a massive advantage over everybody else. And it's up to you individually whether you think that's good or bad or ugly. It's just that that is a huge advantage. Every Super Bowl participant the last seven years has received a buy. We know the value of the buy, and now it only goes to one team. Well, yeah, I, it, I, massive, massive advantage and great. Great for fantasy football people that you more don't More competitive have, later? Yeah, you don't have a team who's the number two seed 
that's just going to rest on their laurels because they know they have the bye week locked up. And they're like, eh, it's not that important to get to the number one. Now they have to get to number one to get the bye week. And, and at the so bottom, I'm, I'm for, very happy about it. At, at the bottom, think about the last few weeks leading up to the playoffs. And you look at the team still in the hunt. And sometimes it's like, you know, with three weeks left to go, you know, it's pretty much just one of these two teams uh, are right. going to get the wild card. Now, those several weeks out with seven teams making it, that you're going to have more teams that are really playing for playoff hopes. I think that's good for football. I think that's good for fantasy. And I, I will say this, Andy, like I hate, I was a diehard basketball fan my whole life. There were a couple things I just hated about before the you, NBA. Before you retired. Before I retired uh, from, uh, you know, from my fandom. <laughs> no, from my NFL dream, my NBA dreams. You've of spent more years saying you used to be a fan than the years you actually were a fan. Oh, That's where you're at. How dare you? That's how where you're at. now. That is not where I'm you, at yet. Your badge of honor is what you used oh, to be in the NBA. Oh, my goodness. That that is that is disrespectful. <laughs> um, it was it was. Yeah. Oh, uh, but my point is they, they have too many people make the playoffs. You know, the, the, the worst teams that get in, they've got no chance. They they stink. And I think that the parity in the NFL and the percentage of teams that are making it is is still still very competitive and, and great. I'm feeling a decent amount of peer pressure to change my opinion on this one. <laughs> good, good. Come to come to the, the right side. And you guys make some compelling arguments about I, I certainly want for fantasy's sake the league to be more competitive longer, fighting for wild card spots and fighting for uh, the bye week, not having those things locked in, it probably does help fantasy owners. So peer pressure. That's all we care about. We got them. (laughs) Success. Um, Okay. Speaking Tuesday, NFL executives uh, confirm the league is fully directed. (laughs) What what a phrase that is. Fully directed towards playing a normal 16-game season with a full postseason in 2020. I'm fully directed towards uh, them doing that. I, I am concur. Full direction <laughs> on that. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I, Be careful. My, <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, here's the thing: there are a lot of people, you know, even even in some circles that are screaming and crying and clawing at this. Like, what? You know, you got to have you got to have uh, other plans. But the NFL. It has time and time again through every, you know, through free agency, through the draft process, every single time that people are like, you got to prepare, you can't do, they're like, we are playing the NFL and getting our money. And, you know, well, look, it, it's the public pressure is one thing. Having, a, there's a large amount of time between April right. 2nd and the beginning of September to adjust. You don't have to make a knee-jerk reaction. You have to make a right and wise reaction, but you have time to make that. And I think that's what the NFL and Roger Goodell has put forth. They said, hey, can we make the draft safe? Yes, we can make the draft safe. We'll proceed with the draft. There are implications that go, you know, we think of it from the side of, oh, the NFL wants to protect its revenue. Well, you know what? The players want to get paid money to, you know, they have jobs, they have a limited career span. So I think it's in everybody's interest to keep as much on the table for as long as possible. They've got a lot of time for it. We're yeah. all fully directed towards the NFL season. Yes, we are. All right. Uh, Anthony Lynn, Chargers head coach, said Tyrod Taylor is, quote, in the driver's seat, but nothing Oof. is finalized. Oof. I'm my dynasty you guys, team. Let's go. You guys know how old Tyrod Taylor is by chance off the top of your head? Ooh, I uh, don't. I would 20, guess 28. Eight. He's 30 years old. So Wow. All right. It's it, You know, he feels like he's gone full life cycle of an NFL quarterback. A bit, b- yeah. Before the age of 30. But he is still young, and we'll see what happens. That'll be that'll mean he, a lot to Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Austin Eckler. He did great things for Baker Mayfield, and I hope he does great oh. things for whoever this rookie they draft in the first round will be. That's I'm not I'm not going to relitigate the the Tyrod <laughs> Taylor circumstances of days gone by. No one remembers that. Uh, all right, this news so far out of the Athletic. Jeff Howe talking about Jared uh, uh, Jarrett Stidham. Oh, on my dynasty team. Thank you, Mike. You have all the I've, superstars. You must have a really good <laughs> dynasty team, Mike. My quarterback situation is dire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, barring unforeseen circumstances, he's got the inside track at the Patriots job. I was asked this question. You guys were asked this question a couple of weeks ago. To me, it just made logical sense that they were going to turn to Stidham and trust their uh, scouting, the draft process. The time they cut that, Cody Kessler as well. Yeah, and they paid uh, Brian Hoyer like a million dollars. Oh, yeah, something. he's on my dynasty team. 
<laughs> oh my goodness! Yes, this is real dynasty this is, season. This is real dynasty season <laughs> when Mike say. and I are basically our teams are <laughs> vying for the starting role of the Patriots quarterback. Well, if we had a Taysom Hill story, I could get involved in this process. But um, no, I think I think it will be Sidham's opportunity. He does have the advantage of being, you know, at practice, part of the scout team, playing against that top tier defense. I don't know if they need a lot from a quarterback to still be a pretty decent team this Yeah, their year. defense is great. So, yeah, I mean, I guess dynasty-wise, that would be the name to pay attention to for your team, as painful as that might seem right Not now. Not Jalen Hurts? Not yet. Uh, yeah. Just, we'll, just we'll do see. it. Yeah. I, yeah, we could talk about Jalen Hurts sometime. Uh, the Athletics, uh, Ed Bouchette predicts the Steelers. This one, I don't know if this is news. This they, one, it's... This, it's, it's just fun to talk about projections. Look, sports aren't happening right now, so let's just get into heated debates about yes. this for no uh, reason. He predicted the Steelers are going to let Juju Smith-Schuster walk following the 2020 season. He's 23 wild. years old. Wild. He had a very bad year last year. Uh, there were reasons externally, but he still it doesn't you know change the output. They had similar problems with James Conner. The prediction is that you know Juju is going to want to get paid like a top tier number one and the Steelers. I mean, I think we've seen evidence that they don't always want to do that. So they, it could come to a head. Now this, I think this, it just depends on whether Juju has a good year. I mean, 100% if Juju, Juju has a good year. They'll, they'll probably pay him. And if he doesn't, he'll probably still want all that money and they won't pay him. Yeah. That's all this is. He's, he's one of the leaders in the, the locker room and the community already at a young age. So if he comes out and has a good year, they're going to keep him around as one of the main faces of the franchise. If he comes out and stinks and still wants great money, yeah, they'll let him walk. So really, this is just, I think this is uh, uh, the Athletics, Ed Bruchette saying, um, I don't think Juju's going to have a good year. Ooh, maybe it maybe. is. Maybe it is. I mean, that's, that's the only way that if he comes out and dominates, they're not going to let him walk. It's certainly one of the bigger stories this year as to whether Big Ben, the Steelers, that offense, especially like we, we talk about it being related to Big Ben and him returning and being old Big Ben. But this team identity has changed too. Old Big Ben might not need to come back for them to succeed. You might just need pretty good Big Ben and lower passing volume offense, and that could be an outcome. They could be a good team with a sure. lower pass volume because of what their defense has been able to mature into. They well, need old Big Ben to be rookie Big Ben. They just come in and be a game manager. The, uh, the great news for Juju is – as Amari Cooper has shown, you just have to be great about half the time. And you can still get $20 million a year. Okay, that is a strong point. <laughs> All right, I added this piece of news in here because I wanted to talk about it. We're sure. looking for direction in Denver for the running back situation. On Tuesday, John Elway offered, quote, tepid words. Ooh on a potential Philip Lindsay contract extension. I wanted to bring this up because Lindsay's in a very unique situation, very similar to what Austin Eckler was in sure. in Los Angeles with the Chargers. Now, you and know, Melvin Gordon possibly in front of him. Yeah, that's ironic. But you have, from a contract standpoint, undrafted, proven themselves, not necessarily in every down running back, explosive, but defining the contract parameters of a player like that are difficult. You guys talked to Austin Eckler on this show a little while ago, and he was quick to admit it didn't look like he was getting a contract. And right. then things came together. So the team has to, you know, because they valued him as an offensive weapon, not just as a every down running back. But when you combine the decision to sign Melvin Gordon with this information, it makes you wonder if the contract situation will phase Lindsay out of the offense potentially or that is a possible outcome. How do you guys view this, or is that overstating it? I don't think that the contract situation will affect the usage of Philip Lindsay. I don't think he resigns with Denver, and I really hope that Lindsay gets paid somewhere. I mean, he's not going to make you know the the girly Zeke money, but hopefully he can play his way into an awesome make the Eckler, type of the contract. Eckler money. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. That would be great for Lindsay. Yeah, and he you know. He he's just been a very dynamic, invaluable player to that team. So it'd be nice to see him rewarded for that. Yeah, it's, man, the the whole draft process is just it's that's a tough one. 
That is that is a tough one for an athlete like uh, like Philip Lindsay and Eckler, where it's it's clear, it's it's very clear that the NFL teams just screwed up, and because they screwed up and didn't evaluate his talent properly, they got screwed and well, think, had to play these play these years on no money. Think about this though, and this is getting very uh, almost uh, conspiracy theorist avenue. Ooh, all but, right. Nice. But when you when you look at a situation with a player that has a contract on the way, and then you look at the team paying Melvin Gordon, and you say, "Well, why'd you spend that money, or how'd you pay?" You you have to wonder if the contract to Melvin Gordon doesn't drive down the future contract for Philip Lindsay. It certainly could. You know, in that situation too, where you save maybe your your total savings is is better than you think, even though you paid a guy like Melvin Gordon. I don't know. That's a good point. Before we get into the top 10 running back rankings, want to thank today's sponsor, Manscaped. Look, if you're listening to this podcast, if you're stuck inside the house with your significant other, you need to be paying attention to this. You still got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of your hygiene, man. Now more than I'm ever. talking to you, I, Jason. I used, it, I used it on my neck. <laughs> Good. Whatever, man. Look, it's, I, it's my neck great... was looking. I was going full on mullet. I thought this was like this is the month of mullets, and I didn't want that to happen. Look, Manscaped is is helping you out. It's the only men's brand dedicated to below the waist grooming and hygiene. And right now, they have the perfect package 3.0. It's a kit. It comes with the lawnmower 3.0, which is waterproof, a cordless body trimmer, and they got a bunch of other liquid formulations to round out. The manscaping routine. It uses nick free advanced skin safe technology, and subscribers are going to get a new replacement blade refill for your lawnmower trimmer to deliver to your door every three months. And for a limited time, subscribers get two free gifts the shed travel bag and the high performance anti chafing manscaped boxer briefs. I've got it the all. The box. I've got it <laughs> yeah. all. Look, I just got a new I'm package. St I'm still using my lawnmower. 3.0. I'm making sure that things are th that things are uh they're they're right and they're tight. Let's just, we'll just put it that way. Things even under still, quarantine. That, yeah, even under quarantine, quarantine. Quarantine does not give you an excuse to mm -hmm. look like you're living in the 1910s. What I don't know how people looked back then. But I'm just I'm making that it didn't have general. manscaped that's back really then. Close, that's for sure. <laughs> that's really close to the last quarantine too. So you almost zoned in on there. Sure. So so you get twenty percent off and free shipping with the code Footballers at Manscaped.com. That's twenty percent off, free shipping at Manscaped.com, and use code Footballers. Help your relationship out during this quarantine. Your partner and your body will thank you. All right, we're moving on. Running backs. All right, it's time. The early top 10 running back rankings. Very excited to get into this. We've each individually ranked uh, our top, I think we ranked maybe the top 24 mm -hmm. as of right now, April, heading into the 2020 season. And we've got our consensus top 10 rankings. Anybody have a guess who might end up at the top of the list? <sighs> well, I, uh, let's say this. He's not the consensus number one. We well, he's the that. consensus number one. He's not the unanimous right. number unanimous. one. Unanimous. That's yeah. Thank you. That would be Christian McCaffrey, and you are right. correct. I do have him at number two. Jason, Mike, you both have him at number one. Uh, he is our consensus number one. Last year, absolutely ridiculous. The most consistent running back that you could ever hope for or imagine. Ran for over thirteen hundred yards, fifteen touchdowns, and then one hundred and sixteen receptions. He was, he was a beast, man. It's the third time a running back has ever done the thousand thousand. It's McCaffrey, Marshall Falk, and Roger Craig. Like it's an it's a historical performance this past year. And when I took a look at what McCaffrey did, honestly, the the rushing totals and the yardage and, and things like that, it doesn't feel like an outlier what he was able to do with that work. I mean, the, the fifteen touchdowns possibly could could be an outlier. But the big questions for McCaffrey are you have Teddy Bridgewater now. You have head coach Matt Ja Rule coming in, changing up the system. What does it look like? And I can't speak exactly to what what Ja is going to try and implement. <laughs> but I took a uh, I took a look at Teddy Bridgewater. You know, because what we we want to know is how much work is Christian McCaffrey going to get through the air? That's the huge yes. That's the huge story for McCaffrey. And I went back and I looked at Teddy Bridgewater's targets in 2014. So his first year, 
23% of his targets went to the running back position the following year, 19 and a half. And then last year in his short stint where he actually saw playing time, 23.5% of his targets went to the running back position. That's all good. Like So that means if Christian McCaffrey is seeing the snap totals, he at least has a quarterback who's going to distribute 20-plus percent of his targets to the running back position, which it's that's very positive news. For me, I hadn't gone through those numbers yet, so I'm still very bullish on on what CMC is going to do. Well, and and also think about uh, you know the the offensive coordinator they're bringing in from LSU. A lot of love given to Clyde Edwards Alaire in, in his receiving work at LSU. That's the system, and they did pass. So you've got both a system and a quarterback that look like they're willing to pass the ball to the running back. Um, so it, you know it, it, the question is the snap percentages. I don't think that that will be anywhere near where he was. And and so if you want to take him off that number one pedestal, it's rare for running backs to finish as the number right. one running back multiple years in a row. So just if you're just going statistical odds on that alone, that's it, it probably won't be Christian McCaffrey who ends yeah, up number one. That's pretty much why he wasn't number one for me. It was it was part the offense changing the unsust. I don't think 141 targets is reasonable again. And then we've, you know, uh, we've talked to some people uh, specifically around uh, Matt Rule talking about him pretty intensely scouting the running back class coming into this year, recognizing the fact that you can't do what you did with Christian McCaffrey indefinitely. And yes, it seems like because he made it through a season unscathed that that's somehow validation that you can do that every single year. I don't think you well, can. Well, basically two. I mean, because he was... He was a dominant workhorse last year as well. Yeah, he, he finished ago. number three at the position in 2018, number one last year. He's going to be in the top three. I have him at two. I mean, we're splitting hairs on the finish. Sure, right. But I don't think you're going to have a season with the total. He might still end up as the number one running back in fantasy, but I don't think your total point output is going to match what he did last year personally with all the transition changes. They've added some more to the the wide receiver core and then some of the things that you talked about um, you know, will he have an incredible year? I'm sure. Will he be consistent? I'm sure he will. He's amazing. So yes, um, it's just a matter of whether Ja Rule comes in and murders murder. the the snap percentage for CMC. Yeah, 44 percent of his total fantasy production was via the air. So that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, he he would have been the eighth in targets among wide receivers. <laughs> so it just that, take work. away his rushing uh, work, and he was a great wide receiver, which is what made him so valuable and will make him so valuable. You get two players in one slot in a fantasy league. He's definitely worth whatever you're going to pay, even if he finishes number two, because he's not going to finish number two or number three because he stinks. It's just going to be because other players had monstrous seasons that were even better. All right, our number two consensus running back, it's Saquon Barkley. I have him ranked at number one overall. Again, splitting hairs. Jason has him at two. Mike, you have him at three. From week seven on last year, you got more vintage Saquon. The year before, he was the number two at the position. Last year, we know limited by injury, but he was the RB5 from week seven on. There are only a handful of players. I think we all recognize this with the workload plus passing game work that can put you in the echelon or in the upper echelon of the position and give you the opportunity to finish at number one. Mike, you have him at three, but do you still you still consider Saquon to be a yes. number one overall potential yeah, type I don't, of player? I don't have I don't have a problem with it at all. He just he's at number three for me. Uh, I mean, we, limited, very limited sample size of him playing with Daniel Jones. I, but that's all I can go off of right now. And the sixteen game pace of targets when when Saquon played with Daniel Jones was eighty eight targets, which is still great, but that's not one hundred and twenty one targets. Like he saw his rookie year, where where Eli was essentially pulling the old, the, uh, and he's playing the piano, the uh, where Eli Manning was doing his best old man quarterback routine, and then and checking it down to Saquon all the time. Where Daniel Jones is more willing to drive the ball down the field. Um, I apologize for playing the <laughs> playing the pretend piano in the middle of what you're saying. And it's yes, right. the, ev the evidence we have with Jones. I mean, we need Jones to. He's got to take a step forward in the offense, obviously. You know, you only go so far based on your quarterback. What about Jason Garrett as the offensive coordinator now in New York? Um, Jason, you have him at you have Barkley at two. You see him as the, you know, the next best guy behind CMC. 
I, th- I, th- I think he'll get more passing work than Ezekiel Elliott will. And that's, that's all it is. But these two guys are, uh, you know, the, between Christian McCaffrey, Saquon and Zeke, those are the top three backs. And it's an order of who's going to get the most receptions. That's, that's my tiebreaker. And I believe it'll be CMC with the most. Saquon with the second most, Zeke with the third most. That's how I ordered them. Uh, sure. They're all excellent on the ground. Um, you know, any one of these guys could finish as the number one. And, and you know, these guys have had bad stretches as well. You talk about Quinted, uh, quintessential Zeke, or I'm sorry, Saquon from week seven on. You know, during that stretch, he was the running back five, which isn't bad. But, you know, you, you're hoping for him to be great, to be, you know, a, a, a true difference maker that – you won't find anywhere else. And I, you know, the nice thing about Jason Garrett coming in is you know that when he's got a star back, he's going to yep. let that back yep. be the star. So it, it does, you know, Jason Garrett, while he might get mocked uh, profusely in most media circles outside of Dallas uh, for all sorts of things, including his clapping, um, <laughs> he does provide a little bit of confidence that you don't have to be scared that he's going to bring in some timeshare. He's not going to do that with, with uh, mm-hmm. Saquon. All right, and then, uh, yeah, and he left this guy, and that's our number three overall, Ezekiel Elliott. Zeke has been a pillar of consistency. Yep. Both in occasional off-season drama, but fantasy finishes. Uh, number two, number 10, number five, number four. That number 10, by the way, on only 10 games. So when he plays, you're getting great performances. We've said it before, the one kind of, I guess, I don't know, disappointing factor to Zeke last year was you did not win weeks because of Zeke's, you know, monster performances. He never finished above number four on any given week, which was strange because he never finished outside the top 24 at all on any given week, which even CMC did one time. So the pillar of consistency didn't have uh, the passing game work that matched up to the year before, but still, I mean, what more can you say about Ezekiel Elliott? The, the, one, the one thing I want to bring up about Zeke is the you know, somewhat unexpected retiring of Travis Frederick, who play, played center for the Dallas Cowboys and was an elite center in the NFL for his entire career except the two years ago where, where he had to miss. Uh, so that is, that's a question. For me, I know I still have Zeke up here at number two, but that is a question we have. We've seen time and time again the impact that an all-star center has on a running game, like it because they're up there checking, blocking, uh, blocking patterns, calling out the you know like who's the mic, where where are the hot reads coming in from, and can they get someone who's competent enough that they won't miss a beat? That's it is a fair question. Yeah. yeah it's, it, it, from an you know from a, a decision making on the field standpoint, I think they're going to miss him a ton. I do think we we didn't have elite physical Frederick for a couple of years now. Well, yeah, it, two I mean, years it, ago he didn't he didn't play, uh, and and you had Zeke finish as a top five back. Sure. So uh, that that's where you know it comes down to me of the the how involved in he is he going to be in the passing game, and I I've got him third of this group. But he's he's. You know, as a pure runner, I think he's probably the best in the in the NFL. And and behind, oh, Andy does not agree. I, I think Zeke is powerful, is fast. Is, no, I think he's a great runner. I don't think he's the best in the NFL. That's all. Who's the best? Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's Saquon Barkley. Mm-hmm. I think Saquon Barkley is the best between the tackles runner. Uh, that that's fair. I mean, splitting hairs between those guys, but the consistency that Zeke does provide, not just this last year, but over his career. It, pretty much nobody in in modern day football since like Ladanian Tomlinson finishes outside the top twenty four less frequently than than Zeke. He is not ever going to hurt your team. Um, he's always out there uh, unless he's suspended. So <laughs> you know, fair. If if you're wanting to be risk adverse, Zeke is the way to go. And we let's get into some more interesting names here. Number four, we have Dalvin Cook coming in at number four. I'm at five. Jason and Mike, you both have him at four. Uh, obviously, a, a tremendous year last year, especially weeks one through 14. He finished fifth at the position overall. Uh, we've talked about Kubiak and Koops. his input into the system and now, you know, taking over. So 
you know, Dalvin Cook, have you looked at Dalvin in light of Diggs' departure? Is that, is that a Cook, consideration? Dalvin Cook might be the biggest winner of the trade. That's what I'm wondering. All. And I'm, I'm not even necessarily saying his usage, usage is going to go way up. I'm saying they can actually extend him now. Like right. that, that has been a, a problem is the Vikings have no money. They would clearly want to extend Dalvin Oh, I thought Cook, you meant height-wise. I thought like uh, you'd get like stretch sure, him out. Sure. Well, yeah. But they actually have money. <laughs> Andy shakes his head at his own joke. <laughs> yes. I couldn't save you. I couldn't think of anything witty enough. <laughs> But Dalvin Cook can actually get paid now by the Minnesota Vikings, so we'll see if the contract talks start to heat up as he goes into the last year of his deal. But Dalvin Cook, 53 really steady. receptions. Yeah, really steady. Uh, I mean, obviously didn't play the last couple games of the season and still had the third most goal line carries, second in fantasy points per game, fourth most evade, in, evaded tackles. Dalvin Cook, very, very good. Receives huge opportunity on a solid team, so he, he's number four for me. Yeah, if it wasn't for his, you know, his kind of injury history here, um, where he got injured at the end of last year, he was injured in college, he was injured the year before, he's had a, you know, an ACL tear. The, the you know, Dalvin Cook is as good. He's, you know, he sh he would be in that tier if he's been playing sixteen games. His sixteen game pace before he got injured last year was thirteen hundred and sixty four yards and sixteen touchdowns that's just on the ground adding another 619 through the air on 62 receptions so this is a true workhorse back on a per game basis he's as good as anyone uh, he's the bottom of the top guys for me solely because of injury risk but the Kubiak uh, upgrade is no deal. it's no joke I mean obviously he was there last year I think he was implementing a lot of what you saw and, and the running game was was taking off with those numbers but now as the offensive coordinator you know, there are certain coaches out there that just have a long enough track record. You know, when you've when you've got the last name Shanahan uh, and Kubiak was essentially part of that uh, system way back in the day, they know how to open up lanes for their running backs. And and uh, so I, I'm, I'm a big Dalvin Cook believer coming into this year. If you know, if it wasn't for him missing the playoffs last year, can I can there'd I be arguments for? you know, being in that top pick. Yeah. Let me ask you a, a, a difficult to answer question. Cause you, you said he's at the end of the top tier. Is he, would you consider Dalvin cook safe? No, Mike, I would. Yeah. Okay. okay. And mine is basically yeah. want to fight. You guys want to fight each other. Injury no. <laughs> solely on injury risk. I started chuckling, uh, during Jason's monologue there, but nothing because of what Jason was saying. I just really looked at you guys again as you're I sitting know. in, in my room. <laughs> Actually, I started looking at it too, Mike. I think Jason, I, now that I'm looking at it, I think Jason copied a lot of what you did with your office. <laughs> I mean, I tried to my It looks so similar to me now that I'm looking at it. I tried my really? best to put the things new in the same yeah. spots. I tried to get them in the same spots to where the perspective would be similar. And I think... <laughs> I think I I think I did a good job. Oh man! All right, all right. Number five, Alvin Kamara. You guys should wait, go grab one of those wait. guitars off the wall. Yeah, just give me a minute, Mike. I've got to do this. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, what you know? I have my questions about Alvin Kamara heading into the year. Really? Yeah, because you do hmm. have. I mean, you have a situation. It's not exactly on par with Beckham and the injury. Because obviously, you know, well, but it kind of is. I mean, you came in with very, very high expectations. This is the number three running back from 2017, number four in 2018, drops to 12 last year in 14 games, inconsistency, didn't look like the same guy on the field, which Jason would mention repeatedly through the year. Then it comes out after the, uh, after the fact that he says his leg was 75% healthy. That's not a high. That's not high enough for my leg. You know what I mean? I need my leg up at ninety, ninety-five percent. Uh, so I needed my leg at about eighty-seven. Okay. Eighty-seven, and I'm good to go. Where? What percentage are your uh, legs, Jason? My legs are usually at a hundred percent. Right now, they're atrophying because of the <laughs> lock-in. So I would say they're at you know eighty-nine percent right did, now. Can I ask did you? Did you know? Oh, go ahead, did, Mike. Say, did you know that just because you're locked into your house, like you could still like do squats and? jumps and go up and down your stairs and stuff 
Well, I do like, go up and down my stairs. They're not locking you out of that. No, I do go up and down my stairs. The kitchen is downstairs. Bed is upstairs. It's a requirement. Those you are wait, my two favorite things. You uh, haven't made like a, a storage area up in your bedroom yet? Oh, Just what dedicated. a brilliant idea. I thought he was going to put an inflate bed in the kitchen. See, I went the other direction. <laughs> really, the, the correct answer here for proper space utilization is one of those little lifts that takes me up the stairs. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. no, that is a full... Like, you have to... To qualify for one of those, you have to fill out your will. I mean, that is that's part of the qualifying procedure. Yeah, they would qualify me. <laughs> I, I can get one. I verified. They, they would qualify me. I was got. I was going to ask a similar question. If you had, you know, gotten some exercise outdoors yet in this quarantine zone. So on that note, we actually did just get a couple scooters, uh, electric powered scooters, Wait, and so. Are- those are I'm not gonna, exercise. <laughs> but I feel like it is. I feel when I go around the block that I am exercising. And it really the, is. The wind is blowing in my face. It's a mental exercise. But I am so sad that I can't burn calories doing that. Mm-hmm. Can you because, pretend when you're using it? Can you pretend you're using can your you foot not to push foot, yourself? Can't you foot push an electric scooter still? I mean, you can, but why would you do that? You'd probably get hurt. <laughs> All right, Alvin, back to Alvin Kamara. I do have my, you know, obviously last year, uh, uh, disappointing five touchdowns on the ground. That was the story. But he only had four four goal line carries, which was insane. Thirty seventh among the running back position. And you know when we headed into last year, it was a very rumored statement. But I had heard it said that look, they can't trust Alvin Kamara alone. Uh, words about him being a little weak, and they needed a Latavius or an Ingram behind him. Came out. Kind of saw it last year. Don't really know why the team would want to put everything on him going into the new year, which is why he's a little bit lower on my rankings. Obviously, the team is great. We've talked about Drew Brees, how set up they are. Still like Alvin Kamara, but I do have... I, I, I just don't know if the consistency you get at with Alvin is going to be the same as other running backs. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw over the, the, you know, the first few weeks of the season some of the same... Kamara that looked unbelievable just you can't tackle him like you can other guys and he catches the ball so naturally you know he had the third most running back receptions and he missed uh, a couple of games there in the middle I I also buy into the leg issues for both him and Saquon I said this several times through the year when they got that high ankle sprain they came back after a couple missed weeks they didn't look the same for another four or five weeks and you know, Saquon was even talking about it was very difficult mentally to trust the leg to for certain moves. And then at the end of the season, both Saquon and Alvin Kamara looked great again. It was like they were championship, you know, league winners in those final weeks. Um, and so maybe it really was the leg issue. You you brought it up already, Andy, the five touchdowns. You know, his touchdown rate was unsustainably high the previous year. And it, the pendulum swung way to the other side. I expect it to be right in the middle uh, this coming year. And and so because he has less volume in the running game, that's why I've got him at number five behind Dalvin Cook and the top three. Um, I, Cook and Camaro were very close as to who I would put ahead. That That's kind of the second tier for me. These guys who do catch the ball but carry a little bit more risk. Um, you know, but I, I still think he's 171 think he's carries last year. Yeah, that's yeah, what, what's wild about Alvin Kamara is two years ago when we talked about and he was elite, he was averaging just under 59 rushing yards per game. Last year, he averaged just under 57 rushing yards per game. He has finished with 81 receptions every year of his career. You just saw, uh, you saw a big downturn. A- 81 in, on the dot. 81 on the dot. That's just that's it, all they book him for. That is they, they crazy. Even, that's it's insane. crazy. But. But you saw the efficiency, you saw the big plays in the passing game go down, where two years ago it was 81 receptions and 709 receiving yards. Last year, 81 receptions, only 533 receiving yards. And then it's like that's the the downtick in Alvin Kamara is big plays in the passing game and, on, and only five rushing touchdowns compared to 14. That's the difference to me. And now to me, that's that's the injury. I'm I'm buying completely into that, and I will be very happy with Alvin Kamara as my RB1. Interesting. Okay. All right. Uh, six and seven on our consensus list. Derrick Henry, 
and then Nick Chubb. I have Henry all the way up at four. You know, he got franchised. Yeah, this it's, team's it's, enti- the entire def. Uh, you know, the the defining characteristic of this team is finding a way to get Derrick Henry twenty carries a game. I like that. It's a good thing for fantasy. Sure. Three hundred and three last year, fifteen hundred and forty yards. We talked about the buying or selling of Henry or Chubb in you know up above fourteen hundred rushing yards. I don't know if he gets there, but I'm pretty sure he's getting double digit touchdowns in this offense this year. That's fair. Um, I know he's not involved in the passing game. But you just look at what he did from a consistency standpoint last year, regardless of the passing game work, fifth, first, third, fifth, fifth, first, seventh, third. He can still finish at the very top on a weekly basis without the receiving game work. So I'm expecting more of the same from Henry. Uh, That's why I'm at four. My questions for Derrick Henry completely come down to, are they right about Ryan Tannehill? That's the, the biggest question to me because last year, uh, Derrick Henry was the running back 14 in, in, with Marcus Mariota, which is still solid. I mean, running back 14 is is nothing to be upset about, but he jumps all the way up to the running back two in the games where he was he was playing with Ryan Tannehill. So that because snaps went way up, rushing attempts went way up with Ryan Tannehill because they're winning games. So that's the biggest question. And then the offensive line with Conklin going to the Cleveland Browns will and I know it's just one piece I I totally understand that but an offensive line it's they need congruency they they are they have to work as one when you change in just one player sometimes it screws up the the entire chemistry of the offensive line so will they be able to maintain that as and still give him the protection he needs or or the, the 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 running lanes that he needs to be the elite fantasy runner yeah I mean if I think if the expectation was that he's going to just continue to do what he did with Ryan Tannehill the you know the the last you know two thirds of the year, then he would be the running back He'd one. Be, right. I mean he, he he would be on you know twenty touchdowns and two thousand rushing yards. Who cares if he catches a pass all season? Um, I don't think that is the expectation. You're right. Conklin was big to the right side of the line. They ran Derrick Henry more to the right than to the left, and he was most successful going around Conklin, but that doesn't mean he wasn't successful to the left or, you know, he was always running to the right. To the left, to the left. Not to mention well, every, this, team everything. Clear, this team doesn't want to disrupt what they're, – they're paying Derrick Henry franchise money. So there, there's obviously – it can disrupt it, but you have to imagine that they believed it wouldn't to do it, you know, to let him go. But Yeah, when, when I looked at the running back rankings, because I, I, I think Derrick Henry is an outlier, a, a beast. We've talked about that. I – uh, he's going to succeed and be awesome. He's going to have monstrous games. Um, I I know he can disappear if the game script were to go the wrong direction for him. Thankfully, I think that the Titans are a good team, and I think they're going to be at the very least in the majority of games, if not outright winning uh, a lot of them. And so he he's safe to me. But after that tier, those first five guys, that's where I felt comfortable putting the great running backs who aren't pass catchers, that being Derrick Henry and, for me, uh, Nick Chubb, those two guys uh, who I worry about the receiving work, you know, they're not listed as the best fantasy back. And this is where I'm comfortable spending that pick on a guy who might have game script worry. Yeah, I really, that was the hardest challenge for me was deciding to put Henry up above Alvin Kamara because of the dynamics of, you know, uh, PPR, half point leagues. We talked about Henry in the offseason last year. What can you expect? But when you, when you have a guy getting 300-plus carries, you certainly enter in the outlier category. Uh, Nick Chubb, we've talked about him. Last year, 298 carries, 1,494 yards, and eight touchdowns. Uh, we've talked about the dynamic with Kareem Hunt, Kevin Stefanski coming over. You know, I think Chubb's going Conklin, to be solid. The aforementioned yeah, right yeah. tackle. Yeah, I think, I think Chubb is going to be a solid running back this year. Jason and I, or I'm sorry, Jason has him at seven. Mike and I have him at eight. But uh, look, he's a great runner. He's, he's, yes. a, he's a great runner. And so, uh, you know, led the league with seven games of at least 100 rushing yards. Big play ability, you know, mm-hmm. he, he could disappear and then all of a sudden break off a 55-yard run. And, uh, I, you know, I like when we just intentionally use the number. I so. didn't. It was a total accident. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. All right. So 
Do you guys have anything you want to talk about with Chubb? I, I just wanted to bring it up because if you're following us on social media, I had tweeted this out a little bit ago, just researching. And uh, and if you had Nick Chubb, you certainly felt this. If you were watching the Cleveland Browns games, you certainly saw it. But his efficiency at the goal line specifically carries inside the five. Comically bad. 15 carries for negative 14 yards <laughs> inside the five. He only and had, still had a year where he finished at right. seven. Yeah, he, he had two touchdowns. Could have been number one. Two touchdowns on his carries inside the 15. Of players who had double-digit carries inside the five zone, they averaged a touchdown on 46% of those attempts. And Nick Chubb was down at 13%. And that 46%... That's that includes Nick Chubb bringing down the I'm average. Not, I'm not putting that on Nick Chubb. That's <laughs> that, where that's, off, I'm, that's I'm where offensive that. lines go to win or lose is on that goal line. Yeah, I'm and not that putting offensive it, line was losing. I'm not putting it all on Chubb. No, you it, look you, the eyeball test matters here. Nick Chubb is awesome. Like as a running back, he's great. He's strong. He's everything. The the fact he is that, mighty. That, he, <laughs> Uh, you know, the fact that he didn't get those touchdowns but did get the opportunity, he's not going to lose that opportunity. That's his. He, you know, he's going to succeed more than that percentage just by looking at NFL averages um, because he's not a bad back there. So I think that his touchdown volume could go way up. He's had eight rushing touchdowns, you know, uh, each of the last two seasons. So I, I think he's uh, – certainly in a good position to be worthy of a high pick, even though he's not really the pass catching guy and he's going to be splitting a little bit more time. Like he did the second half of the season with Kareem hunt. Now, do you um, have concern that that split could actually increase in Kareem hunts favor? I, I, th I think it, it could, like they have an entire off season to plan of, we know that Kareem hunt is going to be on our team week one. It's not where we have this system that we built and spent all this time on an offense when we know we can't even use it until halfway through the season. Like it's, it's possible that hunt is in there more than he was last year. It is possible. He's in there a little bit more, but e even with hunt was pretty involved last year. Hunt wasn't just some, you know, throwaway piece that came in, you know, for a couple plays here and there, he, he was in there. And during that time, Nick Chubb was still on pace for 1,382 rushing yards. So, okay. Maybe, maybe he only gets, 1250 rushing yards but his right. touchdown based on that previous conversation goes up so i i'm not worried kareem hunt isn't scaring me off of nick chubb here at running back seven all right in number eight our consensus uh number eight running back aaron jones of the packers i've got him the lowest at number 10 jason has him at nine mike at seven i'm weary i'm worried uh, the franchise record 23 touchdowns in 18 games including the playoffs obviously those touchdown numbers were outlandish 16 on the ground last year no doubt that Aaron Jones is a great dynamic player, but the way he put up this number two overall finish was not the way that, you know, Christian McCaffrey, Ezekiel Elliott, Dalvin Cook put up their seasons. You had weeks, weeks one, six, nine, 12, 13, where he was outside the top 36. And then you had other weeks that he absolutely smashed in one new weeks. Um, number two overall in week two. Number one in week five, number one in week eight, number two in week 14. You know, the Aaron Jones experience overall was very good, but you did have a different kind of production that was very touchdown dependent. Uh, only 236 carries in 16 games. So I have him a little bit lower, expecting those touchdown totals to come down a little bit. Uh, you know, the, the dynamics of this Green Bay offense, the trend of that Green Bay offense, I'm curious about where it's going to head. So I'm a little more leery than you are, Mike. Talk to me why you have him at seven Sure, compared so, to some of these other players. So I, I went in, when we were doing our overreaction show, I actually went in with the, the mindset of, okay, I'm going to disprove Aaron Jones and say why you shouldn't spend a really high pick on him. And then after going through all the research that I ended up looking at, it was... I think that Aaron Jones can pretty much repeat what he did, especially what seems crazy. He can repeat in the in the area of touchdowns. Like he had thirteen attempts inside the five. Like they were, he was a trusted goal line running back. He turned those into eight touchdowns, which that's he that's basically the same touchdown success rate as Dalvin Cook. 
it's a lower percentage than Zeke. It's lower than Derrick Henry. So it wasn't like he went in there and every single time he touched the ball inside the five, it turns into a touchdown. Like, but he also has he has the advantage of Aaron Rodgers, where defenses have to be concerned inside the five that Aaron Rodgers is going to throw the ball, and because that's what he's done his entire career is is it just pile up touchdowns inside the five. So I believe that Aaron Jones will continue to be the goal line back and and have great success there. So it's I I don't have him you know inside the where he finished last year or anywhere close to it, but I think that he can repeat as a very successful, still have some of those inconsistent games, which is why I have him down at, at seven, but I believe Aaron Jones is still going to be very, very good. Uh, yeah, m- my worry is uh, you bring up the the inconsistent games. He had games where he just flat disappeared. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's weird for the running back to very weird. Yes, to have you know he here's Aaron Jones week one he was the 52nd best running back week nine he was the 45th 12 and 13 44th and 45th uh you know at the position but he finished number two that's because he had a couple monstrous games those three touchdown four touchdown type of games that really inflate the numbers I think Aaron Jones is extremely talented but he's on a team that does not want to make him the guy they want to make him an efficient back who has the you know the the larger part of the running back by committee but I wouldn't be surprised if Matt LaFleur brings in another running back he has didn't he have a quote yeah yeah, the combine yeah, he's he said he, you know he he wants e- an, another back to come in and and help split the load. He's not all about giving Aaron Jones the work, and so for a guy that is fifteenth in carries, while being fourteenth in yards per carry, so he's not like this crazy, you know, uber efficient, you know, r- run the ball five point nine yards a carry type of guy. Those are good numbers. They're not bad. I mean, top fifteen. Uh, but not running back two, not running back five. So, uh, you know, I think where I've got him at running back nine um, says he'll probably have a few more touchdown opportunities still than your average player who is down at like, you know, 15th in volume. But his volume is still too low for me to really trust him. And the touchdowns were just, you know, you, you talk about his opportunities inside the five could be repeatable. They could be. But that means that the touchdowns that came outside the five Almost yeah, certainly not repeatable. Yeah. Joe Mixon comes in at number nine. I have him up at number seven. Jason at eight. Mike at 12. You guys know how I feel about Joe Mixon. I was shocked to see him all the way down at seven for you. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked too and disappointed in myself. But uh, I have him at seven, which is the highest uh, among the three of us. Last year, he was number one, uh, according to player profiler, in evaded tackles, had the fifth most carries. This was a man on a team of Bill Murray's, and he was the only monster. I mean, he every play, he was uh, he was doing his very best to overcome a very difficult situation. Two hundred seventy-eight carries, over eleven hundred yards, just five touchdowns. That's a number that can change with an offense that can move the ball a little bit more, and a number that's um, you know where Mixon ended up last year. I really do think that you can have improvement even though you're going into a rookie quarterback situation. I think you will see improvement. You've got a second year of a rookie head coach, and uh, I, I'm a big Joe Mixon fan. I think there are only a handful of guys that can carry the ball 300 times. You know, He only caught the ball 35 times last year, which was down from the year before. But those numbers, we know capable. he's capable of doing a lot more in the passing game. So uh, with that offensive line last year, I, I'm a big fan of Joe Mixon as the Dalvin Cook of this year. Sure. I, and I'm on the side, I have him at 12. Like you said, I am the lowest because I, I just don't know what to believe about Joe Mixon where a, we, his season is two completely different seasons. You had before the bye week, he was not just bad. He was, he was droppable. You he could was have the dropped. running, he was the running back 31 averaging eight fantasy points a game. You could have dropped Joe Mixon in week five. And up through his bye week, thought I made the right decision because that I dropped him. I don't have to keep playing him. He's just hurting my team. And then after the bye week, he just absolutely exploded. His volume went through the roof. He was before the bye, he was at twelve and a half carries for forty yards a game. That jumped up to twenty-two carries, over a hundred rushing yards per game. It's 
And I, that's what I'm saying. I don't know what to believe about Joe Mixon. I believe he's a very, very talented running back. Gio Bernard is still there. He got a two-year extension before the season started last year. I looked at um, – because we're we're all projecting, projecting Joe Burrow to be the quarterback of this team. We have no reason to believe otherwise. And Clyde Edwards-Alaire, he, he caught a lot of passes. But when you look at – he only had 13.5% uh, of the receptions. Because I, I couldn't find targets for Clyde Edward, but thirteen and a half percent of the receptions, which is I I don't know. And, and once again, that's just I'm trying to look at a quarterback and his tendencies, not saying what the the Cincinnati offense is gonna be, because the Cincinnati offense was we don't really throw it to the running back. Only forty five targets on the season for Joe Mixon, and Mixon played all sixteen games. And Andy Dalton played. Like it's it's wild to remember this team with the first overall pick, and it seemed like they had just completely moved away from Andy Dalton. Dalton played in 13 games. <laughs> like that's, And they were just, I, I don't know what to believe about Joe Mixon. Yeah, I don't, how many games did he play the majority of the games? Because obviously he got pulled at one point and then put back at one point. The 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 real issue I have here, which is narrative driven, you know, not not my, my preference, but it's it's echoing what you're talking about, Mike. The first half of the season, you know, week one, this was not a team that was out there thinking they're going after the number one pick. You know, they went out to Seattle and gave them fits and thought that they were going to be a, a, a decent team, hopefully maybe try for the playoffs. And then things started imploding. They got a bunch of injuries. Uh, AJ Green didn't well, get back their on offensive the field. line was atrocious. Absolutely. Yes. And so, yeah, that first half of the year when they were being what they wanted to be, he Joe Mixon was not very involved and, and sucked. Now, the second half of the year, at that point, they knew they're going after the number one pick. They're playing for several of those games. Their backup quarterback, who sucks, who couldn't throw the ball, and they still, they'll be down. I mean, at that's that point, I mean, you watch these only, games. That was only three games. Andy Dalton, in the games he played, played 100% of the offensive snaps. But you'll watch some of these, you'll watch some of those games where they're down multiple scores in the second half and they're just handing the ball off. Well, they, look, every play because they, it, I mean, and they got the number one pick. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't agree with the contention that like they were doing what they wanted to do for the first eight games of the year. I mean, part of that problem with Joe Mixon was he had six carries in week one. He had eight carries in week six. He had ten carries in week seven. What you're saying is right. From week ten on, they just gave him the football. I mean, he just didn't have the football before that. So it, to me, that we've seen this guy finish in the top ten. A year ago, we saw him finish at 13 last year on the worst team in football. So going from 13 to seven on the basis of the second half of the year is, is why I make that jump. And they've strengthened their offensive line as well. So if they liked what they got from Mixon over the back half of the year, I'd be really surprised to see some sort of uh, regression from Mixon second half if the team is taking a step forward, which is why I give him a little bit more credit. And Jason, you have him at eight as well. So yeah, I, I I don't I don't you know hate Joe Mixon at all, but you could also make the argument that the team figured out how to use him, utilize him better as the season went on, and that that should continue. The good news is the Bengals have gone hard. Who's the other after their they defense? Started? Oh gosh, uh, Finley. Yes, Ryan Finley. Oh man, those are bad. Um, those are some Pittsburgh bad. Steeler quarterback days. But the Bengals have gone out in free agency, and real they were one of the biggest winners on at least one side of the ball. Their defense got a ton better, and so that is probably good news for Joe Mixon being able to continue to get the ball while they're not trying to get the number one pick. All right, and we've just talked about uh, this guy rounding out our top ten. We talked about him on the Tuesday show quite a bit. Some of the reasons that uh, we're big fans this year, Kenyon Drake. Comes in at number 10 overall. David Johnson is no longer a part of the Arizona Cardinals offense. Kenyon Drake was incredible to end the season. Uh, this is an offense with Cliff Kingsbury, Kyler Murray, that is growing up, certainly. And DeAndre Hopkins' addition only helps that. They also secured the right tackle. And I would guess that their first-round pick is going to be an offensive lineman. Yep. Uh, that would be where I'd put assumption. my money right now. So Drake ended up at number 10, versatile pass catcher. Uh, this is just where he ended up on our on our ranks. Do you guys have anything you want to add to kind of some of the discussions we talked about on Tuesday? I, no, I mean, just if you want to hear me talk about Drake, Tuesday show is still available. He was the yeah. RB4 from week nine on for context in the kind Arizona of. offense. He was the running back four, but he also had his bye week during that stretch. 
So he was the running back three on a points per game basis, only two there better with Christian McCaffrey and Derrick Henry. So he he was unbelievable. So we're going to get into some more running back rankings uh, coming up on our next episode. Probably some more interesting debates, too, about some of these guys that our opinions differ on quite a bit. Maybe some players that we're looking at taking that leap, making that tier jump from being somebody that was an RB2 type of player to having Very RB1 excited. potential. Very excited to talk running back 12, Frank Gore. <laughs> oh, no, he's not He's not your 12, is he? No, he's, <laughs> he's everybody's 12 forever. That's what he yep. is. They, re he is they retire that finish. He is all. In yeah, the there's no of, more. There's no more running back twelve. It just you it got just 11. goes from eleven to thirteen. <laughs> That's yeah. like a jersey retirement. You yes, can't they finish retire at running finish. back twelve anymore. Yeah, you can't finish at tight end twelve anymore either. Jason Witten has claimed it. That's where. <laughs> well, he still can. He's still got a job. That's right now. true. He does. Uh, we want to thank Pristine Auction, by the way, for supporting the show. Great company. Go check them out. A Dalvin Cook signed jersey yesterday, eighty five dollars and ninety nine cents. That's pristineauction.com. Use the code BALLERS and you get Ballers. a $10 credit. So for I dollars. think that'll do it for today's show. I'll be interested to uh, hear some feedback from the Foot Clan on these top 10 consensus running backs and look forward to this next episode as well. So thank you for tuning in, everybody. Yeah, make sure you stay safe. Man, our safe. studios look good. <laughs> they do. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.